And so now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Marilla North. No, I don't know. Marilla, oh, there you are. Hello. Uh, Marilla is, was born in Newcastle from a line of English coal miners and farmers. And she says she was radicalised at university, Newcastle University College back wow. in the early 60s and named some names who are responsible. Norman Talbot, Nathan. Harry Jones, <laughs> and Godfrey Tennant. <laughs> He's got a lot to answer. <laughs> um, Marilla is a Dimper Cusack scholar, has been since at least the 1990s, uh, and published a book on Dimper Cusack, uh, I believe, Yarn Spinners, a uh, story of letters in 2001, and is currently completing a PhD at the University of Queensland. And she also notes that she's Novocastrian to the soul. So I think, again, a lot of people in this room would, would uh, empathise with. So, Marilla, would you like to speak, please? Um, yeah, I'm a really proud Novocastrian, and I'm proud of those women sitting there on whose shoulders I stand and who've helped my life um, quite a lot over the 50 years since I first met Jean, and 1997 since I first met Vera. Um, and coming home is, is like a mission for me because I'm bringing Dinsner home too. Um, I've actually been involved with Dinsner since 1979, okay. which is when I first interviewed her about the writing of Coming Spinner with Florence James. Um, we were getting together applications for funding to try and get a feminist collective to make film. But the <laughs> changing light bulbs and making films and feminism sometimes get a little bit stuck. And it ended up going to the ABC, but I followed that path all the way through. Documented the filming, documented the actors, the changes of text, all that sort of stuff. And inevitably I had to leave me in the door of academia because I couldn't get it together by myself. So I went to Wollongong Uni and Maurice Scott was there and all sorts of new Newcastle people were there in the, in the helping of the process of getting Dinsman back to her the next uh, rightful place in the um, literary canon, or if it's such a thing exists, she would like the word canon anyway, and she'd be very upset today because she would pull them into the Gaza this morning, and she would have loved Greg's songs, she would have loved Greg's songs. <laughs> I had the privilege of interviewing her at that, that time, and then she went into the final multiple sclerosis, par paroxysm, which lasted a year and a half until she died. But every time anyone would go and visit her, she said, I've got three more books in my head. Because she did, she wrote in her head, and rehearsed in her head before she actually got it onto paper. She had to because multiple sclerosis got it down to two or three hours a day working life. Okay, Dinfna and the Humber Valley, renamed thanks to Johnny Gradio, a joyful symbiosis. <laughs> <laughs> now let's hope I can make the thing work. Okay, I wanted to just place her in the context of her ancestry and in the context of her life experience up till she gets to Newcastle, because the baggage she brings with her is mighty. Okay, she's four generations from Southern Irish, serious Irish rebel stock, serious seditious charges leading to grandparents um, coming to Australia. And I've even found a convict ancestor that I don't think she knew she had, who came to Tasmania as a, a bit of a, a, a lad in the 1820s. Now, here's the places that she comes from. I think I can use that. These are the four. There's Roscommon, Galway, Clare, County Clare, and County Cork. So that's the spread of her ancestry. And of course, that's one of the big bits of baggage that they bring with them from Southern Ireland, is that intensely mystical Celtic um, spirituality and, and belief system combined with a rabid hatred of the English. They have to turn that into a rabid hatred of the HP, but that's further on in the story. Um, this is where the Cusacks came to. They came to Yass in the 1850s. Michael, her um, grandfather and younger brother, had to escape the famine in the 1840s, the big famine in Ireland. And they came out here because of the earlier uncle who'd been convict helped pay their way to bring them, bring them out. Um, that's actually the bit of land. And you, see, you know the Irish love land. Well, um, the grandmother was the first married to John Kenny. And John Kenny's bit of land is right on the peacock eye of the run. In other words, he's got the river coming round and he's got a temporary common in front of him. And it was land that every other rich Englishman in Yass wanted, the barbers in particular, who still hate the Cusacks with a grand fever. It's quite a, an old feud. And so when he, Kenny was accidentally killed, and Anne and Bowen Kenny 
one of the lessons from the John Arbuthnot boat. She was one of those wonderful women that came out to any uh, workmaids on the, on the farms in the country. And she married then the Michael Cusack that had come out under his uh, um, sponsorship here. Yeah. Okay, now that's the grave of Michael and Anne Bowen Kenny Cusack. She died in the 1890s and he, he lasted until 1907. They were, uh, yeah, a very difficult marriage. She was an amazing woman. She actually took him to court and got ABOs against him for drug and violence. And in the 1870s, that was one hell of a woman. They took that one on. <laughs> this is St. Augustine's Church in Yass, where they were married. It's this, the sort of ancestral seat of Dinfra's paternal line. And that includes the wonderful J.J. Cusack, who was the first member for the Stalin government for Eden Monero, who was in many ways her political mentor. That's just a couple of atmospheric <laughs> images of that part of her ancestry, the Yass ancestry of the Cusacks. And this is James, this is Dad, son of Michael, and James also had a bad temper and alcohol problem. And he also owned the True Blue Gold Mine. He was very, very rich until he went bankrupt in 1912. Dinfra was born in 1902, so she's a 10 year old when the family fortunes turn totally upside down. And they all leave the countryside of West Wyalong and Yass region and come to Sydney. That's the Crowley side, the mum side. Michael Crowley was the Fenian that escaped one, you know, step ahead of the Redcoats, the grandfather of that side, very influential on her. And he owned the Harper Erin Hotel in Tamora before he and his wife Bridget too. A lot of Bridget's in the Cusack family. He bought and farmed the farm called he called Adam Dale. Um, which also goes back to a colliery in Bulli where he worked up when they first came to Australia. But they got out of the mine. And this is old Vic Crowley and old Bridget on their golden wedding anniversary. Oh dear. Sorry, I'll go back to her. There, yeah. There's Bridget and there's yeah. And this is Dinfra's mum there. Another Beatrice B. Cusack. And with her last born child there. And Dinfra's not there because by that stage she was being reared by this lady, who's Aunt Mel Lay, the sister of her mum, who was childless. And because Dinfra was such a difficult child to rear, with the, we now know multiple sclerosis and trigeminal neuralgia, she screamed all the time and had dreadful headaches. Huh. And Aunt Nell had no kids, so she goes and lives with Aunt Nell, which was a lucky stroke for Dinfra because Nell, Nell had lots of money and they educated her brilliantly. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll go that now. There she is, a little five-year-old, dressed by Aunt Nell. There's JJ Cusack, the politician, her uncle, whom she meets when she's about, I think, about six or seven. He's campaigning um, for, the, for, for federal labour by that stage. He's already the mayor of Yass. He's quite a, a high-profile political figure. Right till his death, he dominated the suburb of Fishwick in Canberra. He used to write political material on the wall of his furniture store, which was seen by all. <laughs> in the street and he was sued by many and he sued many back. <laughs> a real character. That's Little Nell again on the banks of the Narandara River with a big sun hat on. Very pretty child. There she's with Aunt Nell again. And that's Mum with the other kids back in West Wyalong just before they leave, just before the bankruptcy and they come to Sydney. There she's in Gyra where her aunt and uncle bought a little corner store and she has her, we think, confirmation there and she goes to Gaira Public School, and she's a very, very talented. She wins a bursary at the um, final, you know, primary school year, and ends up in, well, that's Coogee where the family will go to. I've just chucked that in as a bit of atmosphere. While she's up with Aunt Nell in Gaira, the family have bought a place in Coogee, which would be the sort of the Cusack seat for even more. And it was, it was where the old lady died, and there's no Cusack house there anymore. It's a jolly high rise, but at least they've got a photo of it before they pulled it down. She goes to St. Ursula's College in Aldo, and that is a Grazier's daughter school. It is an incredible school with an incredible tradition. The nuns from there, the Ursulines, were all aristocrats from Germany who were driven up in the town of Bismarck. And she gets this most incredible education. And what's more, she tops the school in divinity. <laughs> she uh, was going to be a nun. She was firmly convinced she had the calling, the vocation. Um, but her mother said, hang on, <laughs> I've got a potential breadwinner here. <laughs> how about you just take a year off and see how you feel in a year? And of course, in a year, she accepts a scholarship to Sydney University and Sydney Teachers College. There she is, the last years at uh, the senior dormitories are from all brass plates to the school. 
and that the chapel is that's just the most glorious thing. When you blow it up, the details are immense. And there she is as a, a very winsome and very holy and pious religious lass. Then she goes to Sydney, and that's just a little montage I've done for you to sort of picture what she was like as she walked across the lawn to the Great Hall, took the tram from Central after getting the tram in from Coogee, up to the Yon Four Turreted Tower. Oh, I've lost him. Yon Four Turreted Tower is just there. And that's the sweep of the university at that stage. These are the most important men in her life, except for Mommy Freedom. George Allen Wood, her history teacher, he was the first Chalice Professor of History at Sydney. Thomas, uh, sorry, Tasman Lovell, who was the first Professor of Psychology. He talked them all about sexology as well, so she left university quite well informed and practised. Christopher Brennan was um, the arts, of course. He was in his very drunken, lurching stage, but he still gave the, the public lectures on everything. I mean, he didn't just lecture in poetry. He lectured on the whole zeitgeist of Europe in the Renaissance or whatever period he was in. His knowledge of art history was phenomenal. And he imparted that to Dilfner too. She was very much involved in the visual arts as well. And there's James Forthrop Bruce, the mystery man that got chucked out of Sydney Uni because his politics were too communist. And he ends up in, in India. The only place he could get a job in the world was an Indian university. But he was always thought to be the successor of George Arnold Wood when he um, committed suicide, sadly, we lost Woody. Sorry, I just missed that bit. George Arnold Wood committed suicide and the thought of Fourth Rock Bruce had taken over because he was an actual heir, brilliant teacher, and brilliant about the story of the The university chucked him out instead. They were very good at doing that in those days. They chucked Fred and out as well. There she is, this beautiful young graduate. There's her year, her graduation year. Her quals, which she kept in the papers to the end, they were very important quals because they were the Cusack family's passport to buying a house in Coogee. She you know, got out there and taught and the money came home to pay for the family home because B, Cusack, her mum, had two more kids to bring up after her because the little one, little B, was only two when James deserted the family. So it was a serious hard call and Dimfrey was a very responsible daughter. That's her boyfriend at the time, sorry, that's John Thackeray. He was a Burrenjuk boy and that of course meant she was part of the Barber clan and part of that old feud. And so his mother made sure he got out of the picture quite quickly. She wrote a play about it, which is very funny. Um, during the, the, the uh, early first teaching years, she was at Neutral Bay because um, T.D. March was the Minister for Education then. He was also the member for Coogee and Randwick. And Mrs. Cusack and he were quite friendly. And so he hooked the family out by getting Dimfrey kept in Sydney instead of doing her normal country practice, you know, country service. She ha ended up having to do it. But for two years, she joined the, the Sydney Bushwalkers, was one of the first women bushwalkers with Laurie Biles. And they used to do some amazing walks right out into the wilderness then. But it really was. Wiseman's Ferry was wilderness then. And this courthouse cave and the judgment rock grabbed her imagination and the hugeness of the Great North Road building that the convicts did. She wrote several stories, got them published in the Sydney Mail and in the Illustrated London News. So she really worked hard to get the convicts on the map in a period where people were hiding their convict ancestry. She uh, honoured their labour, I guess. And the Grandies were on the way back from a trip to um, Queensland with her brother and mum before she got sent to, where she got posted, which is Broken Hill. Um, the trees had been felled hugely by then. There was no cedar left in the Bulgaria National Park. There was very little tallow wood left. Um, there were still the Grandies, those incredible giant gum trees, which is still a good stand of them there. But the destruction of the forest um, destroyed her spirit. I mean, she cried about things like this. She seriously was hyper empathetic and she would cry when she saw a site of despoilation or when she saw a, 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 an act of indignity against another human being. Her emotional force was quite gigantic for someone who would have only come up to there or me. I mean, she was a very, very small girl. Okay, so she sent to Broken Hill and these places are festering in a, in a brain. The destruction of the natural environment just really got to her. And of course, she gets to Broken Hill, and what does she find? Thousands of miles have been felled for mine props. So it's an absolute barren desert. And then she sees the families of the miners who survived the 1919 Great Strike. And what have the kids got? Malnutrition, rickets, hair falling out, teeth rotten. It, an appalling sight, a destroyed population, as well as a destroyed natural environment. So she set to and she wrote this amazing play, which has never been played, which we 
got to, got to bring it to life, Johnny. It's a fabulous play. Um, it's called Strange Victory, and the strange victory is the irony that men will give to others the power to destroy them by going out on strike, because strike, in the end, didn't bring the gains back, the health back, to those kids who were destroyed in the process of winning what should have been an arbitrated and decent right of people to work a 40-hour week and have safe working conditions. So she wrote the play and she took it into town, that's in Broken Hill in 1928 29. That's her class at school there. And there is the epicenter of Broken Hill while she was there in particular because he'd only been killed about nine years. And that's Percy Brookfield's grave. Percy Brookfield was a Labour member uh, for Broken Hill. Um, however, he was also a former miner in a big way and leader of the mining uh, union there. And he tried to broker the demands of the, of the miners during the 1919 strike and got himself kicked out of the Labor Party for doing it. I mean, the Labor Party hasn't changed, folks. It's been doing it for a long time. <laughs> and she, um, he was in jail, and then he stood as an independent from jail, and he won. Broken Hill voted in there, Percy Brookfield. And so from jail, he <laughs> brokered the final agreement. And then he gets out, and he's accidentally killed by a mad Frenchman on Silverton Who Station. Else? So in Broken Hill, it's regarded as an assassination. She got there, and this was in the air everywhere. So she got involved with these. This is her king list of influences in Broken Hill. And it's the people as well as the place all was for Dimfner. She lives vicariously the stories of the people that she's working with and writing for. She goes to Morris Bannister, who's a municipal librarian. He too was down the mine and his health destroyed for 30 years, but he come, becomes a municipal librarian. And he introduces her all the Russian classics. He really brings her to world literature. She chucked English at Sydney because it was so parochially British and she couldn't stomach it. So she did a major in history and psychology and she chucked English after first year. She comes across Paddy O'Neill, who was the uncrowned king of Broken Hill. He was 30 years in charge of the Barrier Industrial Council. And his hatred for the BHP, the proprietary, was absolutely legendary. And he, he won so much over his period in, um, in office on behalf. He was a, he was a patriarch, he was um, sexist, he was um, a bully, he was all those things, but he really fought for his men and he brought the results home. And Dimfna admired him, even though I think she was intimidated by him. But she uses him in that play, Strange Victory. All his values permeate the characters in the play. Bob Gollan, of course. Bob Gollan and later on his wife, Marie Stewart, he marries Mary and comes up the Hunter Valley. But in Broken Hill, uh, he was coming years behind her at uni, so it wasn't part of her cohort. But he teams up with Edgar Ross, who's up from Melbourne, and the editor or sub-editor of The Barrier Truth. And the two of them start the WEA. The WEA is a powerful, powerful force in this period for socialist education and for working class ideas, and an imperative force, in fact, it was. And Bob and Edgar start a series of courses on communism, on Marxist theory, etc. And Dimfner does all these courses, excels in them, of course, but she gets a total grounding in real politic in Broken Hill. The two years there really taught her what she became politically. I think she was on the edge of radicalization when she left Broken Hill. So it didn't quite happen for a couple of years, but she had to mind P's and Q's. She needed that job because her mum needed the money because I had to bring up the other kids. She gets involved again with the natural world with Dr. McGillivray, the Barrier Field Naturalist Club, and Crystal Harris, who also, if you're lucky for the income, happened to be teaching at Broken Hill at the time. It's also the time she does Sturt's trail across the desert, and you can see her little butt just in there, <laughs> pushing the car out of one of its many boggings on the way across the desert. She goes, she, they get to Pool's Tree, they do the whole thing of the quest for the inland sea, the five of them. And she writes more about that as well and sends that to the Sydney papers and gets it um, in print. But she's becoming quite well known as a freelance writer as well by this stage. But she takes um, the play, um, Strange Victory, to meet her first meeting with Norman Talbot. Norman Talbot. <laughs> Norman got around. That wasn't bad. Was it? <laughs> he pre-existed. Norman Free. He, she meets Norman on the, on the Easter of 1928 at the Journalist Pub. He was a foundation member of the Australian Communist Party, the CPA, 
um, but he signed on as A. Shatanov. <laughs> 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 He's not down as Norman Freel, because he lived a total double life. He was a journalist for the um, Packer Press. He was a top financial journalist for the, for the Packer Papers. And he just had, he was very dapper and he was absolutely double line. He walked the whole time because he was organising all the propaganda for the party and the teaching <laughs> courses, the classes, the whole thing. And somebody went up and said to Sir Frank Packer, you've got two communists on your paper. And Packer, they said, said, yes, and they're the best journalists I've got. <laughs> so you, you, if you hold your head up high, you can, even, in, even that was during um, illegality too, he was on the paper. And she brings in the play, and I think it was, I'm pretty certain love at first sight for her, um, but he was married and had two kids, and they kept a very cordial correspondence for some years. But I think they leapt into the cot by about 1932, that's my, my feeling, because he comes when she's at Bonadea uh, Hospital on Rush Cutters Bay, um, having broken her knees doing jujitsu with her brother, and brings her a whole lot of books and flowers. And I mean, it was a, that's a gesture that it conveys a lot of emotion, I think. So I think they were emotionally at least involved from that date. Okay, uh, she gets posted to Goulburn, and there again, Mari Stewart and Bob Gollan turn up. They're about to get married and be sent to Cessnock High to be nicely there in the middle of the Great Depression and in 1937, when the mining unrest in Australia was absolutely the highest peak it had ever been. The mining deaths were the highest they'd ever been. One Faggy, 39, I think it was killed, were killed by the, the gas explosion of one Faggy. Um, the Hunter Valley was out all the time. Now, Aberdare was in total chaos. It was a really bad year, but they're still back in Baltimore, so we better keep them in the sequence. Then she goes to Parramatta High, teaches there for two years, gets involved with Lucy Woodcock, who teaches Federation activists, another very brave and wonderful woman on whose shoulders we stand. <laughs> and Lucy gets did for really radicalised. She gets to doing surveys on the status of the health of the kids in the schools, like at Parramatta. You can imagine work camps that were outside Parramatta then, she, in, the, in the early years of the Depression. So Dinfra starts learning the social sciences. Where is she there? Oh, can't you see her? It's that glowing little white oh, face okay. right there. Right. There she is. And this is another big mentor, Tommy Atkins, the headmaster of Parramatta. Because this, by this stage, she's going into the usual time of manifestation of MS in young women. Broken hill heat affects her. Heat's one of the five factors. There's five factors. It's a multifactorial thing to actually happen multiple sclerosis. It is probably a dormant virus. That's what they think the thinking is these days. But um, she comes back from Broken Hill quite ill via Goldman, of course. And in the three years of Parramatta, she probably had 18 months of those three years home ill when Tommy co covered for her because they all knew she was the point of the family. So she um, turns a play uh, that she was writing with Ross Tuvi, which probably you wouldn't know. Red Sky Morning, does that ring a bell? You know that one? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a really lovely play about the kind. It's a romantic realist. You know, well, she was a romantic realist. It was a play about the, the convict. Um, persecution in the early years of the colony and the convict hero was in the lime pits in Newcastle. So we have a tenuous link at this stage mm -hmm. with Red Sky at morning. Mm -hmm. She go, takes a cruise the, uh, the first time she's ill and she's pretty healthy still in 1933. You can see how nice and plump she is. She goes overseas and she sees Namia, which was a French colony, and she learns firsthand about colonial domination and persecution, or what you want to call it, subjugation of the native populace. And she comes back very angry about that. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, Murray Bowles is a big concept. She dedicated Goody National Park. She was also this first female lawyer in Australia. And Ross Tuvi, she like to do the door to I can't tell you that. I'll check for you, but I can't tell you. Give us a bell and I'll check. She um, was, I think she was a natural science teacher too. Different orders tend to gravitate to the natural science people. Um, when she's had this big bout of multiple, which we now know, they didn't know it was multiple sclerosis then. It was only diagnosed in 1979, mm -hmm. two years before she died. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> at this stage here, Mari Bile subsidises her to take a sea cruise to try and get herself back in health. And of course, she's finished Jungfrau. If you haven't read, read Jungfrau, you should. It's the best young liberated woman novel ever to be written in Australia. It still stands very tall as a piece of literature. It's a very, very good book. Jungfrau is the young woman, the young virgin growing up in Sydney. It's got abortion in it, it's got everything that you know, life throws at young women who are determined to be 
independent and make their own way and pay their own way. It's like her cohort at university story. It's a, a very close to the bone of being docu drama, dare I say. Um, <clears throat> she takes the manuscript with her and she calls in at Melbourne, which is where Norman's now working um, in the 30s. He goes down to um, ostensibly work for Reuters, I think it is, right? The wire service had just begun. But he, he was doing a lot of other stuff for the party as well. He was known as the passport for the, for, for, uh, for the party. Um, so that when they needed stuff taken overseas, J.B. Miles and Sam Norman. And we've just found some um, records of him going across Canada in the early 1930s. I think he was probably investigating the work creation projects, because I think that was a strong lobby of the party at that stage, to have useful work for them to get money for the doll. But so she takes it down to Norman. So it's pretty certain to me that she's also, he's also mentoring her writing development. He was a very good journalist, a very competent writer. I've got a couple of these unpublished manuscripts, which Donnie will end up getting for the archives. And they're quite interesting pieces of, of writing. But his political writing, quite, quite interesting stuff. He was a good teacher of communist um, theory. She gets then sent to Sydney Girls High. Sydney Girls was the plum. That was the job you got if you'd been a very good teacher. So she gets Sydney Girls High. Flossie Campbell's overwhelmed, gives up her own office on the ground floor for definitely use because she's just been appointed the first vocational guidance counsellor in New South Wales. She went to uni with Harold Wyndham. He was given the job of setting up vocational guidance because they realised 10 years after it should be realised that the education system was training kids for university when they were only going to end up on the dole or in work camps or whatever and needed practical skills. Excuse me, Marilla, I'm sorry. Thanks, Jean. Thanks for coming very much. And she um, uses that little office to great purpose because it's the only phone in the school. <laughs> if you're a strong fellow traveller with strong organising abilities and you're organising international federation conferences and bringing out anti-Nazis to educate a state government that's pro-Nazi, a phone is really <laughs> handy. And so Diffner got her phone. Flossie Campbell so thought she was organising pageants for the Sesame Centennial. She did a bit of that on the side, but what she was really doing was working for Teachers' Federation um, for Sam Lewis. If you remember Sam Lewis, he was a great leader of the New South Wales Teachers' Fed, and for Lucy Woodcock, of course. She also did a lot of drama. I put that in to remind me. These are prompts for me, some of these visuals. She did a lot of drama with the school, and she did do the big pageants at the showground for the Sesame Centenary. She was a very able organiser and a very good drama coach. That's the school grounds back then. That's the library of Sydney Girls in the 1930s. And, and that's the grounds of what was the old zoo. Oh, and I put Cora Buckley there. I got her in, Johnny. She's there because Cora Buckley ends up head of the English department at Sydney Girls High. And guess who she hates with a vengeance? Our nice little lefty, Dimster Cusack. Because Dimster by then is so high profile in Sydney. She's giving radio broadcasts all over the place. She's painted for the Archibald Prize by guess who? Joshua Smith. Oh, I know, he's hung, she's hung in the 1938 article. I mean, her profile is just going and going. And also, a little bit of hubris comes in. She starts doing naughty things, like telling the journalists from the um, Australasian that her three main hobbies are listening to Beethoven, surfing, surfing sorry, and she, any spare time after that, she devote to the perfect world and arrange revolutions. But she thinks <laughs> emphatically that any kind of revolution is a good thing. <laughs> now, Sir Bertrand Stevens and the conservative of pro-fascist government were not very happy about that. <laughs> and of course, this is the angelic face she presents to the world. That's a publicity shot for Jungfrau. So she has this ability to look like the, you know, the, the absolutely virginal, um, beautiful, sweet young thing, who I think Leslie Reese said she glowed with an incandescent white fire. And she was a very, very beautiful and a very attractive and desirable woman. And she, she then goes and says that in the paper. So she also does some interviews about her, after, whether she gets up early or late. Of course, she was always late for school. She actually names it in the paper. So she was doing really risky things by then. She was setting herself up for a fall, and she was going to get it too. Okay, this is the big. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> well, that's all building up to the puzzle. All of Rhodes' 
Tommy <laughs> Apostle. <laughs> so there we are. She comes up to Cessnock with the Gollins. She takes on the Minister for Education, Drummond, in public, names the effects of world surveys on nutrition's effect on children's learning, and challenges him to provide free school milk for the kids in the coal fields in particular. And that campaign goes on until Drummond's out and the, uh, the new government, the Labor government, get in. And Clive Evatt, the Minister then for Education, does institute the free milk. But she's regarded by the miners as their heroine. From 1937 on, she is a Hunter Valley girl. She got up and she spoke on behalf. She sat and listened to their stories all weekend. She came back, gets that material in the Teachers' Federation journal. She publicises their plight. She is, in fact, an advocate. She was a very good advocate for social justice and for people who didn't have a voice. And that's the beginning of her Newcastle connection. She then organises a conference in Sydney the next year for, with Sam Lewis, bringing all the anti-fascists from around the world and sending up the uh, newly re-elected government in a little satire called Tubbs Teaching Tabloids. Tubb was just the nickname for Tubby Stevens, who's got a much longer name. Tubbs. Yeah, yeah. And so she sends him up publicly at a Teachers' Federation conference. So she's just said the revenge is going to happen. And it did. At the end of 1939, she won a workers' comp case against the education department. Headlines on the papers, Dick Turpin tactics on poor teacher, this sort of you know, rallying cry. And she's summarily dismissed from Sydney Girls and sent to Bathurst High as a supernumerary, making the cups of tea for all the other teachers. She sees the effects of war on a civilian population, especially the young teenage girls, who end up, you know, depraved, I suppose the word would be, with the troops having their way before they go to the front. And she takes a year off, lives with Xavier Herbert for six months of that year, running a family um, little business that she set up, a boarding house. Her mother did that her whole life, um, in Potts Point, and learns the next step of the um, R&R on leave soldiers impact on a big city, right, and ends up um, taking the notes that will become coming spinner. So it's in her mind by the time she's then Yay. thrown into Newcastle. Yay. And in 1942, uh, she takes the first notes of what will be Southern Steel, which I think is still one of her best books. She lives at 1 Murray Avenue, upstairs in that room. She puts the bucket down every night for the troop station at Fort Scratchley, bucket for cocoa, and the understanding that they'll get her out if the bomb comes, and the bomb does. Oh, that's Norman. He's always around. He keeps coming in and out of her life. That's the pocket photo that she kept of him her whole life. I've had it restored because it was really badly creased across his tummy. But that was her talisman, I suppose, which was oh, whatever was going on in her life when she was putting herself on the line. There was, there was Norman there. Miles Franklin came to Newcastle while she was here. Her brother was out flying for the war, and when she got to first year with Sydney, uh, Newcastle Girls, and then 43, it was Newcastle Technical Boys. And in the history lessons, she just taught them living history. She just read all the letters that John Bede sent from the front, <laughs> and they learned their history by his experiences in, in the Second World War. So she's, lot, again, published quite a lot in the Newcastle paper. They give her lots of, lots of press. They cover all the talks. She's written up everywhere. She's becoming more and more Newcastle's um, adopted daughter, and that's how she was regarded by all the people I've interviewed in the last 30 years about her experiences here. She was definitely regarded as more than just a teacher who, was, who came and was loved. She was regarded as an integral part of the fabric of the working class society of, of Newcastle. That was the day the bomb did drop, which was the 9th of June 1942. I don't need to remind you of that story, but she did her usual little stunt. She went home after she got let out of the bunker and she wrote it up and got it in the next day's paper. Their story, the ordinary people of Parnell Place who lived through that shelling, she got their story in the paper the next day. And that was the motivation for Southern Steel. She wanted to tell their story, and she wanted to do it by their witness. She wanted to just slightly disguise their names. They're very easy to decode. The sweet apples, what's a sweet apple? A cox. So it was the cox family story that's at the, at the core of, of, the, of the novel. That's just a quick glimpse of what it looked like around that time, and that's uh, a little a little bit to let you know that she was also involved as well with the WEA in Newcastle in a big way and with the lobby to set up the University College of Tyson. So she got very involved in the education fabric of the town. She talked to almost every PNC meeting <laughs> she could get to. 
And there she is, thanks to, to Bessie Weller. That's a photograph of her taken with Bessie's little box of brownie the last year, the last uh, week did through as a Newcastle Girls. And I've put in a little note to remind you all that Cora Buckley turned up when she opened the door of Newcastle Girls High. There was Cora Buckley, her nemesis at Sydney Girls. They transferred her to yeah. keep an eye on Newcastle in Newcastle. And she persecuted her the whole week. She had a horrible year. It was really unpleasant. She loved it when she went across to, to the boys' school. And there's a photograph of it the year before she got there, but you can see how brand new spanking it is with its agenda to educate the boys for the trades. And she had a great year there. Lydia Loschiavo was there. Vinge did the mural at the bank corner. You know the mural that's in the bank at the bank corner? Vinge Loschiavo is Lydia's brother. He was one of the perpetual sisters of the involved in some stage. Oh, well. <laughs> A very career. And, um, yeah, she... <laughs> Yeah. And that's it, that's the book, that's The Southern Steel. If you haven't read it, you should, because it is the truest book to this town. I was my English teacher of Newcastle Girls, gave it to me to read in 1958, Gladys Gow. And when I read that book, Gladys it was like Gladys Gow, my beautiful English teacher. Oh. Yeah, It was like recognising my own family. It was so true to Newcastle, so real. And my family's just like that bifurcated sweet level family. Side that stuck with the union and the working class, and there's the one that gets out, gets the education, rises to the top of steelworks management, and there's the conflict always between the siblings in the families that that happened to in Newcastle. And that was a very typical Newcastle story. And she's just captured it to the absolute essence. Oh, at the same time as she's teaching the tech, the, the tech high school, she's also co-directing with Hartley Arthur the filming of her play, her convict play, Red Sky and Morning, set on the convict that came from the like, it's Newcastle. And, of course, Peter Finch is in it and John Alden. It's totally disappeared. I've searched England and Australia. There's only an empty can with the title on it in the National Film Archives. It's totally disowned, which is sad. She also wrote this amazing play about the canteen at Tyrrell House um, while she was here. That, that deserves a resuscitation, too. It's a, it's a, a comedy, good, good parts for women. It would make a nice little theatre uh, play. Very much, again, reflecting the life of the women that she was living around, the women who ran the canteen, the girls who fell in love with the damaged soldiers, all that stuff. It's a, it's a lovely piece, a very, a very vintage piece, but it gets the zeitgeist so it lives. And I think everything she wrote in Newcastle lives because of it, and everything Newcastle inspired. Of course, as we've decided to title this, A Joyful Symbiosis, the relationship between your friend Newcastle was symbiotic. She loved the place and gave all she could to the people and its needs. And she took from the place the love of the beauty, I mean, the sweep of the beaches, the whole thing, the locations and the, and the, um, the society, the culture, the way it worked at Parnell Place in a small community under threat in a big war. These are the manuscripts, these are the books that came out of Newcastle. She always went back to Newcastle. Every time she came back to Australia, she came back. Norman's sister lived out at Kerry Bay, so they go and visit her. But she also come down and do things for, for International Women's Year and speak at the town hall for various of the party uh, things. It always trailed by ASIO, I forgot to tell you. From 1942, when she worked for Jesse Street Sheepskin um, for Russia campaign, she, her ASIO files like that. <laughs> So, she's morning sacrifice, she finished her staff room bitch in this place, she got a revenge on Cora Buckley. So I'm naming her today for you, Dimshner, I'm sure you'd be pleased. CSP, um, which one's that? STS, Shoulder the Sky. Oh, Comet Soon Passed. She got a revenge on, on um, Xavier Herbert while she was here as well. She wrote and workshopped a play about a vain artist who could only circle in his own orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Then it, she also did uh, Shot of the Sky, that, that play, so we're up to Manuscript 3, that totally depends on Newcastle. The doco she wrote, wrote in 1947, I left the nine up, were two, two documentaries for the Newcastle Sesame Centenary, Blood on the Coal <laughs> and From Coal to Steel. And they're very, very good pieces of history research. The primary research that she did at the Mitchell to write those scripts is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And of course, last but not least, a really interesting but fractious little story, The half burnt Tree. It's set at Seal Rocks, and it's got a stolen child in it, an Aboriginal stolen child in it. So it's, it's, very, it's a, a Vietnam vet who's been damaged by Napalm, who starts out, and this, it begins with him trying to crash himself against the rocks. A very innovative way of committing suicide. So it's been a bit, bit over the top dramatically, but it also captures Seal Rocks and that whole beautiful area of the valley. So there we are. She kept coming back until she could no longer come back because she was crippled from multiple sclerosis. But Newcastle always 
with her, you know, her heart, one of her heart signs. And I just would, in conclusion, say that this little presentation today is a tribute to two women on whose shoulders I stand, which is Evadne Joyce North, my mother. She was a nice arts girl during the war, and to be a deacon, who's the Rainbow of the River. <laughs>